Good morning. Good morning. Oh, we're alive in this place. Uh, I'm going to have to read the next part because I'm so excited. My name is Beverly Morgan <laughs> Welch. I am the executive director of the Museum of African American History, and I realize I know most of you, so this is uh, silly. But I want to welcome you to this rededication of the African Meeting House on its 205th birthday. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise in honor of the presentation of our national colors. Today's color guard is from the 54th Massachusetts Volunteer Regiment, the living historians of Company A and the Massachusetts Army National Guard. We're taller. <laughs> Please take your seats. I will be your narrator on this historic occasion. I knew that today when I looked around this space, I would see it restored and rejuvenated and want to rejoice. I just want to say that it's simply divine. The African Meeting House is the oldest extant black church building in America, and the building of this holy sanctuary encouraged other free black northern coastal communities to build churches and meeting places. From the Abyssinian Meeting House in Portland, Maine, to Abyssinian Baptist Church in New York City. Other Boston churches grew out of the Meeting House, including Charles Street AME, People's Baptist Church, 12th Baptist Church, and a synagogue. If anybody else knows of another building that was first a black church and then a synagogue, please see me after the program. <laughs> and of course, Congregation Leibovitz, now the Boston Synagogue. First, I must shout out to our ancestors who with their independent spirit forged freedom and organized this church. I must pay tribute to, uh, to the past congregations. I must honor the founders. I must call the names of Sue Bailey Thurman, Henry Hampton, and Ruth Batson. I was going to say, can I get an amen? <laughs> I believe that they would be well pleased. I must salute 
the former board chairs and board members, and lift up the stewardship of former executive directors, and staffs. I must applaud our partners, our contributors, and I must pay homage to the architects, engineers, designers, constructors, and to the trades, painters, and woodworkers, lighting specialists, and iron workers, and plasterers. This community began organizing early on. In 1775, the African Lodge. In 1796, the African Benevolence Society. The African School in 1798. And then this mighty African Meeting House in 1806. Here we are, folks. It's been some time in the doing. This is not the first restoration of this space, but is now the complete restoration of this space. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our charming chair of the Board of Directors, Carmen Fields. Thank you, Beverly, and thank you to all of you who are gathered at this sacred time. In 1806, <clears throat> several publications reported news of the first dedication of the African Meeting House. This article appeared in Spooner's Vermont Journal, and it read in part, the African Meeting House in Belknap Street, West Boston, will be dedicated on Thursday next. The religious services will commence at half past two o'clock. After the dedication service is performed, Mr. Thomas Paul will be installed to the pastoral charge of the African Baptist Church in Boston. There has been a subscription paper handed to the public to obtain money to purchase land and build a meeting house and schoolroom for the Africans and people of color, which has cost $7,350. Have times changed? <laughs> this restoration effort has cost $9.5 million. Now, it is my purpose and privilege on behalf of the Board of Directors and staff, members and partners of the Museum of African American History, and the co chairs and host committees of this celebration to state our abundant gratitude for the generous contributions made by individuals, by corporations, by foundations and government agencies to this historic restoration and to this rededication ceremony. Our major donors to the restoration include the National Park Service, Save America's Treasures, the Massachusetts Cultural Facilities Fund, the Massachusetts Office of Travel and Tourism, the City of Boston, Liberty Mutual, Walmart, Bank of America, Keyspan Energy Delivery, now National Grid, the 1772 Foundation, the National Trust for Historic Preservation, and under the auspices of the National Trust, the Lowe's Charitable and Educational Foundation, and American Express. While I cannot read the list of all of the charitable donors, they are detailed in your commemorative program book. Soon, a tablet will be placed in the new entryway with all the names of all the benefactors of the African Meeting House restoration. 
I also want to thank the co-chairs of this historic rededication and those who have provided support in celebration of this special event. Ernie Herman, Charles and Pamela Ogletree, Marita Rivero, George and Faye Sampson Russell, Jerry and Kathy Sargent, and Jim and Kathy Stone. Major donors include the State Street Corporation, the TJX Companies, JP Morgan, and Citizens Bank, and to our media sponsors, the Boston Globe, the Bay State Banner, and the WGBH Educational Foundation. I would like to recognize our elected officials who are here gathered. Sherry Rolfez is from the office of Senator John Kerry, who has graciously provided a congressional resolution. State Representative Byron Rushing, Boston Mayor Thomas Menino, Boston City Councilors Michael Ross, Felix Arroyo, Ayanna Presley, Tito Jackson, and State Representatives Linda Dorsina Forey and Russell Holmes. Our special guests are many, and while I cannot mention them all, I want to introduce those associated with the congregations that once worshiped here. Reverend Wesley Roberts, please stand, of People's Baptist Church. <laughs> Ruth Fine, Chair Emerita, the Boston Synagogue, please stand. And also, the Reverend Gerald, Arthur Gerald, the pastor of my church, 12th Baptist Church, who will offer the invocation. I'd like to invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Eternal God, the event we have assembled here this day to commemorate is to us of sublime interest and should be welcomed with enthusiastic joy. It should be hailed with the united plaudits of a free people and consecrated with the incense of thanksgiving and praise from the altar of our hearts to the God of truth and freedom, free men and free women, acknowledging no master but God. We commit this in your name, to your glory and honor, I pray. Let everybody say amen. amen. Say amen again. Amen. And shout it out for history. Amen. amen. God bless. Congregation Leibovitz worshiped in this holy place for more than 70 years before the minion of the synagogue agreed to sell the African Meeting House to the museum in 1972. Here to pay tribute to Congregation Leibovitz with our gratitude and grace is Carrie Sharon. Ooh. 
winds never end, the sand and the sea, the rush of the waters, the crash of the heavens, the prayer of men, the sand The crash of the heavens, the prayer of men. It is now my pleasure to introduce one of our most stalwart supporters, our marvelous mayor of the city of Boston, the Honorable Tom Menino. Right. Uh, thank you very much. It's really a, a pleasure and a special honor to be asked to say a few words here this morning, the very dedication of the African Meeting House and. Uh, Beverly and your team did a spectacular job on this re rededication and renewal. I remember being here a few years ago, we had this young student uh, from Emerson College telling the whole history about William Garrison. It was one of the most enlightening times I've spent any place in my career talking about the past history. On behalf of the people of Boston, I want to congratulate all of you the Museum of African American History for preserving uh, this historic building. And it's so important that we preserve the past for our future because a lot of folks out there don't understand what the city and this country went through in the past. And this is going to be this, this building here. It's a building with a great story that comes out of all these walls that will be told over the years. And I know Byron Russian is going to be speaking later on. And he's going to be the historian here. He knows all those stories. <laughs> Boston really is a city of American Revolution and black patriots helped to guard the city streets during the Revolutionary War. Even though there was still slavery in Massachusetts, they were led by Colonel George Middleton of the Bucks of America. Our state's first governor, John Hancock, gave them a flag for their service. Milton's home still stands. It's the oldest home on Beacon Hill. So it makes sense then, here on Beacon Hill, the black community decided to build a meeting house shortly after the revolution. This community was organized, and they're very savvy. They made friends and connections with anyone who would honorably stand with them. They fought to end slavery in Massachusetts and throughout our nation. They organized schools, became the children's, because the children's future was so important. They offered food, shelter, and clothing to people who escaped slavery. That's probably why we have a six, such a large concentration of underground railroads sites on Beacon Hill. And as with Beverly, we had a discussion the other day, how we create our own little freedom trail here about those sites as people come here, but the other sites within Beacon Hill. It'd be a great, you know, part of the history. And I'll finish off the story. President Lincoln himself said that Boston had done more to bring on the war than any other city. <laughs> we usually do. 
Doesn't depend on what kind of was they are, occupation and all that stuff. Oh, God. Uh, and when emancipation had been achieved, he generally, generously credited the results to logic and power of garrison in the other anti-slavery people. There are so many amazing stories like this one that's such an important part of Americans' heritage and history. More people need to hear these stories because if you don't know your history, you have no roots. You have no foundation. Boston students, each and every student in this country needs this history. And I tell you, that's no truer statement. Our students, each and every student, understand how we got here. And they don't understand that. I think we got, that's why this is so important, other programs we have, education, how we fought for our freedom. They can see themselves in these stories of organizations, challenges, and triumphs as engaged citizens in our world. Today, the African Meeting House is finally and fully and beautifully restored. It takes its proper place alongside Old North Church, the Old South Meeting House, Paul Revere's home House, the Old State House. They were all national historic landmarks that define this city. Our history, our character, and our citizenship for Boston and for the nation. And I just want to finally say that um, Beverly and I had a good conversation last week, and I think we, yes, we are rededicating this, but we have other things we want to do. And we've got to stay committed to continue to, like I just said, educate, inform, so our youngsters really can understand that this freedom has fought real hard. And we've got to make sure they understand that because, you know, honestly, folks, I think our kids don't understand that at all. They understand playing with those foolish machines. They sit there all day. <laughs> they won't talk to you, kids. Your grandkids won't talk to you. <laughs> you know? But I see Superintendent Johnson back there. We've got to get, folks, our programs aligned with our past. So we can talk about our past and about the future and how we all got to work together. I saw the impressive numbers that we used to, re to do the re rededication and remodeling. But this doesn't stop here today. This is a celebration, a celebration of the next chapter of this museum. It's a chapter, it's a book this chapter is closing. Let's start another chapter tomorrow on how we continue to make progress in reaching out to folks who aren't here, who never came here, especially our young people. Beverly and all you folks, thank you for doing what you did. And we'll continue to work alongside you as you make sure that this building, not just the building, what's in the building, the people in the building, the message that comes out of the building, that's so, so important. Thanks a lot. The National Park Service has been our major partner in this historic restoration. Governor Deval Patrick brought the African Meeting House to the attention of Secretary of the Interior Ken Salazar, who recognized the importance of the African Meeting House. They helped the museum to secure an American Recovery and Reinvestment Act award through the National Park Service of $4,138,000 to complete the restoration, creating 125 jobs. Our partners at the National Park Service include, first and foremost, Boston African American National Historic Site, as well as the Northeast Regional Office, the Denver Service Center, and headquarters in Washington, D.C. 
It is my honor to introduce to you our paramount partner in restoration, Northeast Regional Director Dennis Reidenbach, who will introduce the Deputy Director. Thank you. A little over a year ago, I joined with many of you over at Tremont Temple, where we were celebrating 200 years of history. And I actually had the privilege of bringing that little present, that $4 million check, to help finish the restoration of the African Meeting House. But you know, it was also another anniversary as well, the 30th anniversary of Boston African American National Historic Site. At that time, on behalf of the Park Service, I pledged to all of you that we would continue to tell the story of the struggle of justice in the African American community in 19th century Boston. The reason was simple. That story is important to the National Park Service as well as, as we tell the stories of all Americans. Today, we get to celebrate the success of that project. The African Meeting House and similar sites across the nation remain important to the National Park Service. And as proof to that commitment, I am very pleased today to introduce the Deputy Director of the National Park Service, Mickey Fern. Trying to get my heart to slow down. It's, uh, <laughs> thanks, Dennis, and I'd like to thank Cassius Cash, who, who is our superintendent here, uh, who has shown unbelievable leadership for this work. Uh, one of the things that we're trying to do at the National Park Service is to get people to see us as other as tourist attractions or as outdoor recreation experiences. Uh, we want to be seen as educational institutions in classrooms, places for discovery, scientific laboratories, research institutions, historical, archaeological, and cultural centers, uh, places of unbelievable beauty and interest that both are artistic and that inspire art. We want to be seen as an archive and an archaeological record of our evolution, and we want to be seen as places for community healing. Uh, I believe this place is a perfect example of all of those things come together. We're also committed to making sure that we use our cultural and natural resources to inspire Americans towards civility, environmental and civic stewardship, and civic engagement. Um, people ask me uh, frequently, I'm a political appointee, I've been with the National Park Service for only two years, and people ask me what my most amazing experience is, and you really have to define it in two different ways. Uh, when you go to a place like Yosemite, uh, you, you have this feeling of unbelievable awe and spirit and the belief of something bigger than you. When you come to places like this, there's an unbelievable sense of affiliation. There's an unbelievable sense, and, and the sense of affiliation has been more important to me than the sense of awe. And so I will say as of now, this is the most important experience I've had in the National Park Service. So I, I had lunch yesterday with, uh, with Cassius and, and with Beverly, and we were talking about the, the journey that it took us to get here, the journey it took me to get to be Deputy Director of the National Park Service, Beverly's journey, Cassius' journey, Brian's journey. And, and I started thinking about uh, all of these circuitous journeys that got us at this place here at this time. Uh, and it's almost like, uh, the, the ancestors, the people who were here before, were convening us here. We're, we're like calling us here to sustain their dedication and spirit to the constant struggle and pursuit for civil and human rights. Uh, and, and I think when you look at all the people in this room and all the people not in this room that contributed to this, I think it speaks to that. In closing, I just want to say that at the National Park Service uh, and for Boston National Historical Park, we're proud of being partners with the, with the Museum of African American History and the many other organizations that, that made this day possible. And we want to continue to be involved in telling these stories. Thank you very much. There were there were two committees, a committee of black and a committee of white men who joined together to design and build this meeting house. 
One of the white gentlemen was named John Waite, baker and chocolatier, to superintend the business, as they said. Some of these gentlemen made large advances and the house was completed in 1806. This restoration has had the best historic preservation, architectural, engineering, trades, design, and construction firms and professionals who not only have mad skills, but the proper respect for the historic fabric of the building as well as for the history. Ladies and gentlemen, our illustrious architect, Jack Waite, also known as John G. Wait, Associates, and our eminent. Thank you, Beverly. This is a great day, and we're very pleased to be here. We think that the African Meeting House is one of the most significant historic buildings in the United States, a National Historic Landmark. It was the first structure in North America built largely by and entirely for the cultural needs of a burgeoning early African-American community. As such, it is the oldest remaining religious building constructed for a black congregation in the United States. Winston Churchill said, we shape our buildings and then they shape us. <laughs> Certainly, this is true about the African Meeting House. Think of the characteristics of this building, its simple elegance, its unpretentiousness, its dignity, and the fact that through two centuries it has retained its basic integrity. It can be certainly said that these characteristics influence the many people who helped to shape the history of the United States within these walls. The African Meeting House has had a long and fascinating history. It was constructed in 1806, largely by free black laborers. However, the original building committee included six white tradesmen, not wealthy businessmen, professionals, or religious leaders, but tradesmen, bakers, an auctioneer, and a chocolate maker. It was a great struggle to get the money to construct the building but people persevered and eventually it was accomplished. In 1855, at the height of the abolitionist period, major renovations occurred. The sanctuary that we see today was largely redone. Cast iron columns were introduced to support rebuilt balconies and new stairways were constructed along with an apse. On the exterior, new, larger windows were installed. In 1898, the building was altered again, this time to accommodate Congregation Libovitz. The building remained a synagogue until 1970. In 1972, it was acquired by the Museum of Afro-American History, which began renovations in conjunction with the National Park Service. Our involvement began in 2003 when we were engaged as architects for the current restoration. The first step was the preparation of a historic structure report for the building where all the available documentation on the building was collected in one place. It soon became apparent that the building should be restored to its 1855 appearance because that was its period of greatest significance and also the period from which most of the important building fabric dated from. The restoration became a process of simplifying the building so that its basic integrity was retained. The greatest challenge was the introduction of modern amenities and code requirements such as fire stairs, an elevator, and an HVAC system which were required because the building will remain a place of assembly and be used in daily life and not be uh, an historic house museum. In addition to restoring the structure and finishes, historic furnishings such as the pews, pulpit, and lighting fixtures were replicated. Today, the building appears the same as it did during the great abolitionist rallies of the 1850s and the mustering of the 54th Massachusetts in 1863. Just as with the original construction in 1806 uh, required a large, diversified group of people, so did the restoration. 
Many of the people from our firm who were involved uh, over the past decade are, are here. They include Clay Plazo, who is the uh, principal in charge and project manager, Douglas Booker, who is in charge of the Interior Restoration and Historic Structure Report, along with Shelley Jenkins and Edward Seal. Uh, Shawmut, with Tom Gomat, who's going to speak in a minute, was our construction partner with whom we worked together to solve the many challenges of the long restoration campaign. On his staff, uh, we would like to thank Carl Jay and Ian D. Felix in particular. And in the National Park Service was also a major partner in the uh, technical restoration. Uh, we would like to thank Superintendent Cassius Cash and Richard Chilcote and Stephen Spaulding, if they're here. Finally, the reason the restoration happened was only because of the Museum of American, American History. The key people there, of course, were Beverly Morgan Welsh, Diana Parkhan, and their board. The campaign to raise the money for the restoration and then coordinate with a myriad of government agencies and private groups was a struggle that rivaled that of 1806 when the original building was constructed. <laughs> However, Beverly persevered and never lost sight of the goal. Everyone, every American owes her a tremendous debt of gratitude. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, our eminent constructor. I'm crying back here. This is ridiculous. Tom Gomat, Chief Executive Officer of Shawmut Design and Construction. Good morning. Good morning. It's an honor to stand before you at the dedication of the African Meeting House today. As builders, every project is important. We take great pride in the fact that we have helped create some of the most beautiful and iconic buildings in Boston over the past 30 years. Whether it is a fine restaurant, cool retail, office, institution, or religious structure, they all add to the fabric of Boston, and we are proud of every one. However, once in a while, we get to participate in a truly special project, a project that helps us bring history back to life and celebrates a proud heritage in the history of our city and our country. The African Meeting House is such a project. The challenges of the construction were very real. Tight working site, exacting, his, exacting historical details, and we think it's a wonderful finished product. But most importantly, we have had the privilege to help bring history back to life and provi provide a facility where the history of African Americans in Boston can be passed down to future generations and celebrated by all. For this, we are most proud. We at Shawmut congratulate the African Meeting House on the opening of this wonderful facility and thank you for the opportunity to have lent our skill to this effort. Thank you. Scholarship demands brilliance, perseverance, skill, as well as artful and bold storytelling to bring it to life and to share it in the public sphere to help us understand the magnitude of the history embodied in the African Meeting House, I am delighted to introduce our museum scholar, the ever eloquent Lois Brown. Thank you. Good morning. 205 years ago today, news of the dedication of this blessed place went out into the world. Let us constitute a church, was the call that went out to people of color in West Boston in the summer of 1805, and in December 1806, the historic dedication of this place, quote, to the worship of God, took place. On that day, a brilliant theologian and freeborn man of color, the Reverend Thomas Paul, was, quote, introduced to the pastoral care of the African Baptist Church. He became its founding minister. Newspapers in and well beyond Boston reported that, quote, though the weather was very unfavorable, the assembly was large and respectable. The singing was excellent and appropriate. 
and $123 were collected on that occasion. It was an auspicious moment indeed. Storms raged outside, the church stood firm, and over the course of its two centuries plus, it seems always to be so. The three-story red brick African Baptist Church of 1806 was built on a parcel of land measuring 48 by 59 square feet, Smith Court, Beacon Hill. It was a building, a sanctuary, a gathering place, a community forum, a stage, a spirited oratory, discourse, and lectures, an extension of the schoolrooms known for dedicated and earnest students. It was an elegant place for celebrations and rituals, marriage rites and services that honored those gone on. The church, known over the years as the first independent Baptist church in society, the Belknap Street Church, the Joy Street Church, and in lay terms as the Black Faneuil Hall, was built by earnest prayer and the labors of generous craftsmen. It was financed by unwavering collective faith and carefully acquired funds. It became the largest gathering place owned and maintained by people of color in the city for almost the entire span of the 19th century. And it was one of the earliest institutions in this city to reflect the transformative powers of women. For we know that of the 24 visionary individuals whose stewardship fostered this place, 15 of the 24 were women. This place was always already what the people of this city and commonwealth and nation needed it to be. Women could speak their minds here and in so doing transform the world in which they lived. Children were nurtured as future citizens and spirit-filled individuals, a project so effective that the Reverend Paul was quoted as far away as Ohio for noting that, quote, if something prevents these children from attending Sabbath school, they weep as though they had lost some dear friend. And that not only did the 80 plus children who attended make improvements that quote, exceed our most sanguine expectations, but that children here were reading the Bible with quote, accuracy, some of them having committed to memory chapters. They are, comp they are capable of repeating them out of the Bible without missing a word. Many of them committed the whole of the catechism, their morning, their evening prayers, and a number of hymns. Boston's youngest were assured that this place was theirs and that they were always invited and always expected to grow fully and with purpose. Here, all could be bolstered by the spirit of the ancestors and bravely claim citizenship rights, freedom, and justice for all. This meeting house bears witness to the power of family bonds since so many families were central to its history. Chief among those who were unstinting in their contributions, energies, and confidence were the master mason, Abel Barbados, and his daughter, Catherine, who succeeded in her life as a dressmaker, and when in her 70s, watched over this church and the Abiel Smith School. Acclaimed builder Boston Smith, Scipio Dalton, a man recently emancipated from his New England enslavement when this church emerged, his wife, Rosanna, the devout and unfaltering African-born Cato Gardner, who single-handedly raised $1,500, one-fifth of the monies needed to finance the construction. The fearless and the beloved teacher, Catherine Paul, and her husband, Thomas, the minister, he was first-generation freeborn, and his father, Caesar, despite being torn away when a young boy from his African home, despite being enslaved here in New England, despite being taken to the front lines of the French and Indian Wars, he came back here. He reclaimed his freedom. He took a wife, and he saw six of their sons go into the ministry. What pride must he and his wife, Lovey, have had when they came to live here in Boston in the home of Thomas Paul and his family, surrounded by their grandchildren, and they were able then to witness the glorious fruits of unceasing labors made manifest in this African meeting house. This sanctified place, which included a, quote, lower story fitted up for a schoolroom for colored children and a modest apartment, was born of interracial cooperation, even though this was a city plagued by segregation in its churches and schools. The creation of the African Baptist Church was shaped by these productive partnerships that crossed and even defied the color line. The purposeful stewards of this place transcended they defied the troublesome realities of enslavement and legalized persecution 
They were strengthened by the substantial legacies of men like Prince Hall, founder in 1784 of America's first Masonic Lodge, his Lodge brothers, the Reverend Thomas Paul, and the sixth most worshipful Grand Master, John T. Hilton. This place was the embodiment of an awesome ethos of charitable giving, advocacy, and humanitarian practice. Its members built on African-American philanthropic, academic, polit political, and cultural traditions that began as early as the 1750s. The church's stability and defense of itself was writ large in historic petitions and sophisticated suits filed by women and men of color in order to regain their original freedom and to acquire equal educational opportunities, civil liberties, and representation due because of taxation. The ministers of this church Thomas Paul, John Sella Martin, John Given, Armstrong Archer, George Black, J.T. Raymond, all were learned men. Most were born free. At least one was self-emancipated from slavery. Two white ministers also served as interim pastors during the transition period that began when Thomas Paul concluded his nearly 25-year-long pastorate. Its accomplished church members included Mariah Stewart, the first woman political activist in America, and the first woman ever to address what then was called a profane audience, because it was one comprised of men and women. As well as the Paul Children's School teacher, Susan, who in 1835 published the biography of a freeborn child of color that was shaped by the seamless affirmations of faith and activism that were regularly proclaimed here. Her brother, Thomas Jr., who became the first African-American graduate of Dartmouth College. During his nearly quarter century tenure here, the Reverend Thomas Paul Sr. presided over hundreds of moments of sacred, of, of sacred and holy ritual. These included the wedding of Nancy Gardner and Nero Prince, the second Grand Master of the Prince Hall Masons, both of whom arrived here at the church on a Sunday afternoon in April, dressed in full Russian costume courtesy of Mr. Prince, who was just back from the royal court of the Tsar, where he served as chief butler to the emperor of all the Russias. Members of this church benefited from the gentle ministrations of their pastor, who was legend for the way in which he submerged and raised the candidates for baptism. Nancy Gardner Prince always remembered that day when she, quote, received the right hand of fellowship from her then beloved pastor. The history of this meeting house is a history of accessibility, of intention, of faith, and focus. It has been many places. It has become the Boston's 12th Baptist Church when members separated from here and founded that new congregation. It ha members have been in the Morning Star Baptist Church, and in the late 1890s, descendants of this original congregation purchased the New South Free Church on Tremont and Camden Streets. In 1898, the African Baptist Church congregation moved to the South End, and in 1904, this Beacon Hill site became a temple, the religious home of the congregation Anshi Leibovitz. In 1915, St. Paul's Baptist, Morning Star Baptist, and Calvary Baptist churches held a unification service, and they formed the congregation now called People's Baptist Church. And in 1972, the Museum of African American History, guided by Mrs. Sue Bailey Thurman, purchased the property that has, under the stewardship of Executive Director Be Beverly Morgan Welch, undergone transformative historic re restoration that dazzles us all. This place hosted, welcomed, encouraged members of the community to gather together, to keep counsel, and to assemble for matters that were spiritual and political, intellectual, and cultural. It is no accident that this church was instrumental to the abolitionist enterprise and to the movement against colonization. For its early congregation included members of the Massachusetts General Colored Association, the first anti-slavery organization established in New England. In December 1832, the church provided meeting space when no other local church or meeting hall would do so and they provided that space to liberator editor William Lloyd Garrison so that he could establish what would become the august New England Anti-Slavery Society. Other organizations born here include the New England Freedom Association, 
whose members strategized about how best to support fugitive and self-emancipated people in their midst, the Massachusetts African Provident Fund Society, the African Society, which celebrated its anniversaries regularly with parades around Boston that began here in Smith Court and the Meeting House and then ended here again. It was here that idealistic young people established the African American Female Literary Society, the Boston Young Men's Debating Society, and the Adelphic Union for the Promotion of Literature and Science, groups that organized standing room only events, established libraries, and hosted lectures on ornithology, philosophy, the Burman Empire, and blood circulation, just to name a few. In the age of slavery, people of faith like those who joined this church believe strongly that after worshiping God, the next most holy cause that they must embrace was the abolition of slavery. Within those, these brick walls resounded some of the most impassioned and powerful critiques of democracy, bondage, justice, and power. Speakers like Frederick Douglass, the statesman, the acclaimed orator, the dynamic and controversial British abolitionist um, George Thompson, liberator editor William Lloyd Garrison, the acclaimed lecturer, Sojourner Truth, activist, businessman, author of the incendiary appeal, David Walker, Mariah Stewart, the pioneering political writer, Boston community organizer and Franklin Medal winner, William Cooper Nell, the best-selling writer and racial uplift proponent, Francis Ellen Watkins Harper, and the disinherited but nonetheless resolute Southern anti-slavery worker, Angelina Grimke. The Meeting House was central to the temperance movement and those who were willing to take the cold water pledge and eschew liquor and its attendant evils. The schoolrooms hosted stirring exhibitions by young children, evocative recitations of poetry and drama, sacred concerts that featured renditions of the marriage of Figaro and the harmonies of the Garrison Juvenile Choir, the Massachusetts Union Harmonic Society, adult choral trios, small orchestras, and soloists. In this stately sanctuary, Bostonians gathered for intense and thoughtful debates about equal education in and beyond Boston and public school environments for students of color. The equal school rights movement that so shaped the educational history of this city was born in this meeting house. Indeed, the March 1855 state legislative ruling that integrated Boston schools for the first time had its roots deep in the foundation of this place, a place that provided one of the earliest schools for children of color, whose congregation valued education and supported wholeheartedly the intellectual advancement of the community, and whose members advocated tirelessly for full, full opportunities and rightful educational resources for all. The Meeting House and its members did not shy away from conflict, nor did its members step back from heated wars fought with words or muskets. This church and its community played a defining role in the American Civil War, that unforgettable chapter of our history that was shaped indelibly by the formation and heroism of African American regiments. The very first soldiers to enlist in the very first African American regiments raised in the North were recruited here. All of them took heart, not only in the exhortations of Frederick Douglass or Governor Andrew, but also in the example of, quote, the Black Regiment of the American Revolutionary Army, men cherished by the goddess of liberty, who was then not ashamed to own them as her sons and her defenders. This place lived large in the memory of soldiers like William Carney, the first man of color ever awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor, the two sons of Frederick Douglass, the sons of Boston Minister Samuel Snowden, all of whom were part of the Massachusetts 54th. The men of the 54th, the men of the 55th, the men of the 5th Cavalry, as well as those who served in the US Navy, were part of a mighty tide that helped to eradicate slavery, and they fueled the pursuit and acquisition of freedom and justice for hundreds upon thousands in these United States. Today, we gather here because of the hopeful, the visionary, the ambitious, the unswerving saints who in the 1800s pooled their precious resources, courageously beckoned the future, and deftly navigated the unpredictable times in which they lived. Surely, surely, they are looking down upon us now, smiling with us as we celebrate, and as we all see their cherished, their bold, and their inspired vision realized anew.